Hey everybody, it's Nick here. Two years ago, we visited Anthony Mao of Kupu Place on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. This was a video from that time that we're going to re-release because a couple of weeks ago, I was back in Oahu and visited Anthony as his operation has significantly grown. And because there were so many good nuggets in that first video to uh, kind of bridge the gap between the two interviews, and we have picked up so many subscribers since then to now, it's uh, worth a reissue for you to not only, if you've seen the video before, refresh yourself to set it up for the next interview, but if you haven't seen it before, it's a great video about farming on, on Oahu and on the islands. It's about selling to chefs, growing microgreens, selling at the farmer's markets, and aquaponic head lettuce production. So more importantly, if you're farming, this is what it looks like to be in production year two and year three of your operation to kind of place yourself in his shoes. And then on the next interview, you're going to fast forward two years and see what it's like as a business scales, as it picks up a whole second location and or grows a bunch, if that's your case. So here's the video. And as soon as this one's over, we're releasing the second updated interview. Hope you enjoy. My name is Anthony. I'm a farmer, PhD scientist. Uh, you know, I, I work for Kualoa Ranch. And then this is Kupu Place, my startup agriculture company. We started in 2017, uh, my partner Steven and I, and we both had a vision of creating a, an urban farm that, you know, tapped back into spaces that were once agriculture. So the land that we're sitting on is actually um, historically agriculture lands and was turned into a residential zone. There's an image of this place exactly where we're sitting and it's not developed and there's just crops everywhere. And what we wanted to do was tap back into that and revitalize these spaces for the health of our community, for sharing good food and, and healthy foods at that. So that was a vision and it started with aquaponics because aquaponics was, it's kind of like that modern model of a sustainable agriculture system. And my background is in aquaculture, so my cousin had to train me being, you know, trained in horticulture and landscape. He was coaching me how to farm plants. And then in the same system, I was coaching him how to farm fish. And what's neat about that is together, we were able to figure out a system that neither of us were producing in before that time. And I think we're, it's safe to say that we're pretty advanced in this world now, you know, only a few years later. And we still have a ton more to learn, a um, ton more to apply. So that's the exciting thing about agriculture. And I think for my partner and I um, in, in this company, we're going to continue to try to strive to be at that forefront of using technology and, and growing sustainably with technology. And, and sustainability is, is a, in part, you know, looking at your labor. Um, which is huge in today's agriculture world. Um, looking at your resources, you know, whether it's the media you're using or um, a harvesting tool you're using or it's your greenhouse. And then also looking at sustainability of just your, the overall business and, and kind of like that mission is what you're doing sustainable from a sense that will the community get behind it. So I think the three tier of, yeah, like, are the people happy? Are you functioning well? And is the vision that you currently have for the business um, something that everyone can get behind? So keeping that in mind, I think Kubu Place will be always hopefully at the forefront of agriculture in Hawaii. And um, with the current state of you know, affairs with the pandemic, I think even more so, this type of agriculture has become popularized. Now, we weren't trying to do something that was popularized or popular. We were doing something that we thought could be very productive in a small space. Again, touching back on this being like a really small backyard urban farm. We didn't, we have 1 64th of an acre here and we produce more lettuce and microgreens than I could on the entire ranch that I work on out, you know? So what's nice about that is again, the productivity of the model I think speaks for itself and it motivates us every day.
Okay, so uh, we're standing in front of, you know, our three-tiered outdoor microgreen system. We're growing everything in our 10 by 20 flats from Bootstrap Farmers. And we picked white, figured why not go with white? You can see it and maybe it won't, you know, attract so much heat. Um, the top, we put our sun-loving stuff. So starting with sunflower. We have a couple of mustards in here and I believe some pea tendrils. And then down below, we, we kind of consider how much sun is hitting our, our crop. So, you know, the lower we go, the less light there is. So you can see a succession of, you know, a first week cilantro and then a second week cilantro. And basically we're harvesting that tomorrow. So it looks really nice. You got our full you know, fresh true leaf coming out and cilantro is a really popular one, especially in the summer. In Hawaii, uh, cilantro production is a little bit lower in the summertime and it's a little bit hot and producers have a hard time uh, fighting the heat. So they um, slow down on planting cilantro. And that's really what we noticed in, in, in terms of the market demand for cilantro has picked up quite a bit as we transition into summer. And then it kind of like backs off a little bit going into um, fall again. So considering all of that, you know, we move trays um, up and then out within a few weeks and everything's on that rotation. You know, Hawaii is a cool climate to be in because um, we can grow year round where we don't need to regulate temperature as much. We can actually grow in um, temperatures in Hawaii year round but the heat is really associated with the temperature is the heat that we have to be careful of and mindful of. And so we have about a 30% shade cloth on top of our greenhouse structure here. We built it all out from the ground using wood and, and uh, PVC panels. So in Hawaii, it's, it's important to design your structures to the specific space. Um, in this particular urban space, we have a lot of different features. Like we have the house in front of us um, and we have a little bit of a wind tunnel right here. But, you know, ultimately the shape of and the contour of everything has to have a flow where you can move in and out of everything without feeling like you're stuck. And I think that's important with an urban farm that, you know, you're considerate of every space. Um, from the ground up, especially if you're going vertical and you want to use it to your advantage. So we, we felt like we could fit three tiers here. Maybe you could have fit a tier below, but for us, there's pest issues. So we have to consider, okay, we have a little rodents. So, you know, we have on the posts, on the feet, we have metal sheeting. And then we have to consider we have birds outdoors. So we have bird netting. And, you know, all these things that um, maybe the beginning farmer might not consider are super critical to microgreens because, one, you have restaurants that you're primarily working with and these restaurants require you to have really good food safety and they expect it, especially out of an urban farm where you're not even farming in soil. They're like automatically thinking, wow, this is food safe stuff. But they don't know that, you know, a lot of these urban farms, if they are outdoors, still have the same pest pressures as, you know, an in-ground farm. So that's a, an interesting thing that we've had to learn and, and kind of, again, build our system accordingly and, and our um, growth structure accordingly. We, again, 30% shade. We try not to overshade. Having to our advantage different lighting, light intensities and um, temperatures and, and wind airflow and whatnot, you know, because uh you know a juvenile plant a real small um sprout might not want all that wind it might not want all that light so we use that to our advantage again whereas like if you were to have such a stable consistent environment that is widespread throughout your entire grow area you might have to manipulate that environment and change it to be better yeah so you know underneath here we have our um our pea tendrils that are stacked 
and we like to use the uh, stacking approach. You know, so you can take the stacking approach to a lot of different crops, a lot of different varietals of microgreens. Um, with the stacked approach, it allows you to condense everything as far as the use of space. Again, urban farming is it's critical to um, use every square inch of your property as, as opposed to square footage uh, really wisely. And, and so for us, it's how do we maximize this space in all dimensions? This is a great example of, you know, maximizing that space we can fit we only have three stacks here but we could probably have fit another five stacks all the way across so um, as far as germination again talking about the variables um, covered material so no rain uh, we have a little bit of shade cloth here so reduced light and the idea is to get just an even temperature a stable temperature throughout and so when we achieve that, I think we can germinate anything year round in Hawaii. Um, and we don't need to use heating mats. We don't need to use anything else. Like I said, temperatures, uh, you can grow in it in Hawaii year round. So that's pretty nice. Yeah, so, you know, touching back on um, growing in Hawaii, even within the larger context of Hawaii and then um, working our way into our greenhouse, there's going to be different zones still within the greenhouse uh, where out here this portion of this particular greenhouse is going to be a little bit more exposed because it's farther away from the home and you know there's nothing as far as buildings on this side of the property so as far as wind flow it all channels through here sun sets on this on this side of the bench so we get a lot of sun in the afternoon and therefore again a lot of the stuff on this side is sun loving types of microgreens and things that can handle the heat things that have a nice canopy so they buffer against um, loss of moisture during the warm time of the day but green onions micro chervil um, uh, micro shiso in hawaii a lot of the asian varieties are really popular so we like to plant a lot of those we have um, chrysanthemum up here and we probably do more than 35 varieties at any given week um, and we have three different uh, mixes that we do so we have our kupu mix which is kind of our standard brassica mix we do all our mustard greens together and then we have our chop suey mix which is kind of like I, I would say our most popular mix I don't think anything like it is on the market in the whole US or maybe in the world it's got a, a special formula I'm not going to tell you everything in it but it's got all the Asian varieties and a, and a couple of different things to to make your palate go crazy and then uh, we have sunshine mix which we throw edible flowers on it so the sunshine mix is a, a real citrusy mix it's got like tangerine lemon um, orangey type of flavors in it which is really cool and i think for me that's like the the most fun part of growing microgreens is you get to have so much fun with you know tossing all the microgreens together and and coming up with something that tastes really good looks really good and ultimately gets people fired up to eat it so yeah we have again a, a mixed bag of microgreens and and it also is fun to grow because you get to try all different varieties in a single greenhouse, you know, instead of, you know, being out in the sun and doing one long row crop of something, we have shoot probably over a dozen varieties just on this grow rack. So yeah, really fun stuff. Talking about utilizing our space really well. Um, this structure was designed to accommodate some storage of items like clamshells or salad spinners, anything that, you know, might need to stay up high so we don't hit our heads on anything. And um, these tools that you use, again, should also be in a place where you can grab them right away 
when you need them, you know where to find them. So if, if you have a home for your tools, we find that the efficiency on the farm is that much better. And you can see over there, well, maybe you can't see it right now, but over there we have, you know, all our shears on one rack. We have, you know, everything that we need for seeding kind of in the general seeding zone. Um, and then, of course, uh, we stack all our, uh, our harvesting tools together. We have a nice um, harvester that, that mounts onto a bench. And so, again, um, tying it all into not just efficiency while you're working, but, but efficiency as far as uh, total productivity on the farm. You know, how much microgreens can you process in a, a given time? And that translating to a successful business. So, you know, all the, all the time that we put into this, which really is just um, watering through the week in a one day harvest window, um, we're looking at a, a business that, um, you know, puts out, we probably generate over $175,000 in a year in a, in a backyard space that, you know, if you were doing traditional farming, you probably couldn't make anything close to that. So it's really cool to, to be able to come up with a model that works for us in this urban space. And then, you know, again, with, um, with our neighbors being here, uh, we have to consider how changes in our neighbor's landscape can actually impact the way we grow. So if this bush right here, this home were to be cleared, a lot of the morning light would be intensified into the system. Um, but at the current moment, you know, we play off of the fact that based on the pitch of the roof and, and the height of the roof, we know that, okay, we don't need to worry about that intense light coming in at that time. In fact, we might be worried about not having enough light, but fortunately for us right now, it's, it's a really good time of the year. We get a lot of sunlight. So we're talking about, what is it like uh, 5.30 a.m. to 7 p.m when the sun sets. So that's a lot of time to grow. And, and ultimately, when we talk about sustainability of what we do, we chose to grow outdoors without lights as opposed to indoors with lights for microgreens because we take advantage of that sort of year-round growing condition, which ultimately reduces our overhead quite a bit. I think as not as a farmer, Hawaii is a place that bears a ton of cultural significance outside of the United States before it was, you know, designated as the, 50, the 50th state. And part of the, the story there that I'd like to kind of hit on is that when you come to Hawaii, it's a place to visit, but it also is a place of residence for a lot of people, including indigenous people that have been here long before tourism was ever born. And again, um, when you are in an island that's so remote and, and everybody is practicing things to be sustainable, not farming, just be sustainable because you're so remote, when, some, when another force such as tourism or tourists come in, you have to be mindful that the people here already have this way of living that keeps them sustained. And so when they're rocked by another force that tells them to do, do it this way or be this way, or you should think of this trend, um, it's important to remember that that component of it when you see their responses and when you see people get all frustrated with like, you know, over tourism and, and the roads being so packed and like ambulances can't get through, it's like my family is at a risk because tourism has brought people to the point where there's so many things in the way of just the daily operation of living that, yeah, you know, there's problems with that. So again, with travel, there were people that were upset that we didn't, you know, open up the state as fast as we are. I mean, we're opening up really slowly. Yes, it's safe to travel here, but it's safe for a reason, right? Like we, we created a safe space. We're protecting ourselves because we don't have ventilators, you know, just coming out of our butts. <laughs> so 
there's a limited amount of resources here like that. So once you influence and rock that system in a negative way, then it, and it becomes unbalanced, then we really hit issues fast, a lot faster than the mainland would. Um, granted, we're in a place where, shoot, it's super safe. We're not wearing masks right now, so that's amazing. And I feel like, you know, I just came back from a trip from California to New York, and those places are still kind of, you know, they're not, they're not in a state where they can relax. Whereas in, in Hawaii, we pretty much all are relaxed about COVID. Um, we have our restrictions for a reason, but we're relaxed. So that's a cool thing about Hawaii. Yeah, so another interesting you know, thing about Hawaii, I would say that this is true for a lot of the ethnic background of people that are here. Um, so Asians, Polynesians, um, a lot of the demographic that populates Oahu and Hawaii are family oriented. So we're looking at, you know, multi-generational um, passing of people through the same home and, you know, taking on family businesses, you know, such as Kubu Place is a good example of like, shoot, if someone's living here and we still have the farm going, they're going to maybe take it on, <laughs> whether it's our kids or something else. Um, but it goes beyond just the business. It, it's more, again, for the, the family dynamics. And um, in this home, my grandma lives here. My auntie lives here. And my business partner and myself grew up here. And we grew up as a, a tight-knit family. So this is a family, this is a version of a family farm. You know, but again, to answer it not in, as a farmer, it's every family here in Hawaii that's been here for more than a couple generations is for the most part just so family oriented to the point where like you know nobody wants to get off the rock <laughs> it's it's comfortable here uh we can surf every day we can hike every day we can be outside every day like the 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 living is pretty easy if you take away the work it's really nice to be here so yeah, as a um, somebody who's visiting or, or doesn't know about Hawaii, it, it's both a place to visit but a, a place to reside. And, and it hits home for, again, in a state of a pandemic. And then also uh, for those that are family-oriented, like it's all kind of the same equation. Yeah, so this is our, you know, prep station, washing station. Um, for food safety, we do have a separate hand washing station inside, um, but out here is all washing for um, our products and our tools and everything. And so we use this table for quite a bit of stuff. It's really nice to have a flat bench. We can put um, our microgreen harvester, which is over there. So we can actually bench mount it and Essentially, we're using the tray to harvest. So, you know, say this is one of our trays here. We're sliding it through, catching it, popping it into a cooler. And that whole process is done right here where um, we, try to, we try to move the least amount of distance that we can. Again, efficiency is important for us. And getting the microgreens into the cooler, into cold water is, you know, the way that we preserve the shelf life of our product. So our product um, will last up to three weeks in its clamshell, which is an amazing thing for those that have ever experienced buying microgreens. You don't really see that unless you're buying direct from the farms. But even at that, you know, handling is such a critical part of the shelf life. So. We use a little step ladder. This is our handy step ladder, lightweight. You can move it around. Helps us to water all the the microgreens, hand soaps, even some of our our uh, organic neem oil for our aquaponics. But you know everything is in such a condensed space that it's grab and go. Light structure here for when we're here in the morning. Um, we have harvesting. Harvesting Tupperware. 
So when we do cut flowers, you know, we'll harvest it into a secondary container, uh, food safe plastic container where we can dry them. Seed storage. So we keep all our seeds in the fridge, but we pre-pack our, and this is again, another part of, you know, efficiency on the farm. So when we're here for a short period of time and we're here to seed, we want to have all the seed packets, all the media, everything at our fingertips. We just use a simple plastic bag with pre-weighed out seeds for every variety. We throw them in here. We throw this in the fridge, take it out and then use it. So we had just done seeding. So that's why this whole thing is empty. And then, um, you know, we'll set this up for the next week, put it back in the fridge, clipboard for data recording, bowls again for processing, harvesting. All right. So yeah, one of the, you know, visions for our farm is sustainability. We have different components components on the, the farm that makes us maybe a little bit more sustainable or greener than some of our competitors. But yeah, just deep down, we wanted to have a low impact farm. So for our aquaponics system, you know, features like a solar panel, um, roofing is important to have. But for our microgreens, we're trying to, you know, reduce our impact and our use of things like peat moss and whatnot. So one way to do that is to regenerate the, the quality of this soil mix so that we can reuse it for something else. And we compost all of our uh, spent media flats by throwing it in here and letting it break down over time. And what's cool about this, although it takes time and we probably use more media <laughs> than what you see here in the amount of time it takes to actually break it down really well, What's cool is I've been successful in just breaking it down a little and then taking it out to my other farm and using that media for um, repotting tree starters and things like that. So more hardy plants can be um, potted with this reused media. But we've done it before where we let this sit for six months and it's broken down really well. So it's cool in theory, like not everything works perfectly when you set it up. We probably could use a composting bin that's maybe 10 times the size with how much microgreens we go through. But you know, the idea is there and we at least have a place to put this intermittent of taking it to say another composting site, which like I was saying, I use this compost for um, tree starters. So, you know, everything here hopefully has a, a life cycle that doesn't end here you know whether it's um, the media or i don't know any sort of byproduct that we can find from here that can be used elsewhere we will even if it's building materials if we have extra building materials we'll take it from here use it somewhere else yeah so in this zone uh we're growing a lot of mustards in this zone so we have our red amaranth here Really nice um, Red Kingdom mustard green. River green Mizuna. Just a nice green version of that. Um, another one that does well is our kale. So kale, shoot, a lot of people like kale. I think it's familiar with them, but it grows really well in it. It has a lot of different colors in it, so yeah, we're we're into the kales, the tot soy, um, another popular one. But all these get chopped up, put together in a mix, and and call it a day. We also have a lot of specialty herbs, so things like celery, parsley. Um, in Hawaii, it, it trips people out that they can find a tender version of parsley or a tender version of like a leaf celery. Um, so, you know, the, the average house buyer is going to pick up these products and be a little bit perplexed by it at first. And it's fun to see their, you know, facial expression when they pick up the micro celery and then they use it and they're blown away because they're, you know, they're getting the flavors, but without the textures, the same textures. Um, another really popular one is, you know, lemon balm. 
So, man, these, like, the Vietnamese people, <laughs> a lot of the Asian people here love lemon balm, as well as, you know, folks that make drinks that might need citrus, but it's, you know, lemon, a lemon version of mint, and it's beautiful. And here's some fennel. So, again, um, different zone. This was actually the first multi-tiered zone that we built. And we built it in a horseshoe so that we can kind of stand in the center and reach everything. We have our germination rack below here. And I'll, these are uncovered two days ago. So after we harvest all of the ones on top, then these um, newly germinated trays will come up to the top. Again, working our way up. So same process. And we try to put all of the things that we grow up top um, germinated below so that we can just move it directly up and we don't, you know, we have our like zones again, even though we're in a greenhouse, you know, this structure gets a little bit different wind than out there. In fact, there's not much wind. Um, and and it, essentially, we're just protecting for rain and a little bit of afternoon sun, which comes in directly in this way. So a little bit different use of like a black shade cloth here that's, I believe, uh, you know, 40% light blocking. So a little bit uh, more shading on the side where the direct light comes in. But, you know, otherwise, a lot of our um, setups are similar in design yeah so you're asking like you know what what happens when you're importing over 70 percent of your leafy greens and you know close to 90 percent of all your other foods to hawaii it's a deemed the most remote set of islands the remote most remote state in the u.s and probably in the world and and so what we face as farmers is we have to, again, sustainability is built into what we do because we have to be that much better than everyone else as far as every resource can't be wasted. But beyond that, it's um, everything that we do to prepare for every task and every crop cycle. And, um, you know, it's intentional work. It's super intentional work. So. Yeah, when we look at kind of this space and it seems so simple, it seems, it's just a backyard, it's just a little operation. Like we were faced during COVID with that reality of a lot of the products that we were sourcing still were coming from the mainland, still coming from, you know, out at sea. And that takes a couple of weeks to ship here. And even at that, right now we're experiencing um, delays in all of our freight forwarders. And our barge, during COVID, the peak of COVID shut down for two weeks. And that, you know, created a frenzy at the markets. At, you know, things were flying off the shelf, like you're saying. Food is gone. We couldn't keep up with demand, even for our super high value products, like expensive products, right? Microgreens aren't something you just snack on all day. It's like, hopefully, you know, you're, you're topping like a nice meal with it, or maybe you're integrating into a salad, but it, you're not just munching microgreens like it's lettuce. So because of that, it was so eye-opening because people were just buying as much as they could. Also, the government was helping to um, subsidize food distributors to purchase foods from local farmers. They didn't care what it was. It was important to get food into people's, um, onto people's tables. And so we had a lot of um, food distribution of our sprouts, our more hardy stuff, to the home buyers through these government subsidized uh, programs. And it was such an eye-opening experience because the most simple and, and important material that we use, which is, say, our media, you know, peat moss, for example, is mined halfway around the world. And they weren't working during COVID to mine all this stuff. So here we are in Hawaii. We have an entire business 
surrounded by using potty mix. And our potty mix orders are probably half a year delayed. And at that, they don't even know when the companies are going to start manufacturing again. So it really, it, it really forces us to think differently. And with aquaponics, um, we've solved a lot of those things because, you know, it's just water recirculating. And so that's something we liked about the aquaponics. Now, the microgreens, you know, we're challenged at deciding if we want to continue using potty mix. Maybe we want to get into hydroponically growing microgreens. But at that, it's it's all based on kind of like where our resources are coming from and resources are widespread here at the same token. So we have a lot of um, fresh water. We have a lot of sunlight. We have a lot of good fresh air. We have things that other farmers wish they had. And so when you boil it down to what you actually need and, and think about the things that you can do as a farmer here without things that are shipped in. Um, I think that's a healthier approach. And so everything that we do, yes, a lot of the stuff we grow is not native here, but we try to implement as much as we can of using the resources that we have available at our fingertips in Hawaii um, to our advantage. Again, that's the why the big decision of not growing indoors was made. Um, not over controlling the environment was a big part of what we do. We'd rather adapt. And I think that um, already puts us at a better starting point to where we're not so dependent on all these resources. And so one of the things that we'll never solve growing food crops here like this is sourcing seeds and uh, fertilizers and things like that. And, and it, you know, it is what it is. It's kind of like if we in the future can't farm this way then and it's not sustainable enough then it's not sustainable enough and we'll look at other ways of farming and i think that's again kupu place is a it's an entity that we're not going to be stuck at doing one thing we want to do of course the fun crops like edible flowers like microgreen mixes and and have a lot of fun with those things and work with a lot of good chefs on those products but at the end of the day, we also want to feed people. So food security is a huge issue in Hawaii. And, you know, outside of Kupu Place, we are growing in other places, breadfruit. We are growing taro. We're growing banana. We're growing all the starches that sustain people. And so we do understand the significance of those crops as well. So we're not trying to get away from those things here. This is a very specialized type of farming, and we acknowledge that as part of our um, storyline. And, and if it, again, if it's not sustainable, you know, in the next 10 years, then it isn't. And we can move on from that. But man, aquaponics, 75 pounds of lettuce out of this backyard a week. I, I honestly can't think of a better way to do it. So, okay. So yeah, behind me, I have a, a 500 gallon uh, fish tank here that powers two four by 40 foot grow beds of um, DIY style uh, deep water culture aquaponics. And, you know, one of the things that we wanted to have on our farm was a sustainable leafy green production system. And aquaponics was exactly that in Hawaii. You know, as I was saying, the um, history in Hawaii is that of agriculture so there were traditional systems like growing taro um, fish ponds that were all based on very sustainable practices and um, one of the the concepts of both of those entities whether it's a fish pond or a taro patch is that there's water passing through that delivers a lot of nutrients to these plants or to these uh, phytoplankton that ultimately drive fish well the same concept can be applied to a modern day system like this and so it really hits home for us in hawaii to have an aquaponic system because essentially you have that mountain to ocean feel you're using fish you're using water driving nutrients into your plant beds and um, what's really neat about it is we're only running 500 gallons here into a four by 40 foot grow trough 
that's only four inches deep. So when I said deep water culture, we actually have a shallow water culture compared to some of the other folks that do like, you know, eight inches to a foot of water. Now we might lose out on thermal capacity or stability. Um, the temperature does change as it goes through our system out there. But what's nice about having a shallow system is uh, we're using less of everything, building materials, water consumption, as far as like putting it into the system. And therefore uh, we can actually drive the nutrient delivery faster too, especially when we were first starting up with the fish, um, going from zero nutrients to, you know, over 20 parts per million, which is what we need to grow lettuce. So we also do um, what's called decoupled aquaponics. And so taking it one step further, a lot of folks would say that we're undergunned with the amount of fish we have. We only have um, 30 fish in here to power about 75 pounds of lettuce a week. And the only way we're able to do that is because we actually um, chamber all our waste put it into a bioreactor and then spit that nutrients back into the system. And um, that's been a phenomenal approach for us. At first we didn't do decoupled and we were just doing research and we probably were growing about a third of the amount of plants in the same space. All right. So this is a, a hybrid Nile and uh, Mozambique tilapia is crossed by local researchers at the University of Hawaii. And we use a hybrid uh, because Nile tilapia are really fast growing, some of the fastest growing tilapia. And with the uh, Mozambique tilapia cross, you get saline tolerance. So if you were to be doing aquaponics um, with more of a marine type of plant, like say you wanted to do salicornia or something like that you could with these fish um, you can also just grow them in salt water if you wanted to and and grow and the meat quality is a little bit better than grown in fresh water so really um thank you <laughs> really versatile fish to have in aquaponics you know a lot of the as a, a small farm in hawaii i mean even a middle-sized farm in Hawaii has to import virtually everything that they use, uh, you know, going from pots and trays to fertilizers and seeds to, um, you know, packaging and everything associated with being a farm is, and being a business, you know, incurs cost and the cost is extremely high in Hawaii and it's all due to shipping. So our remote location forces us to ship. Shipping, you know, by freight takes a couple of weeks, but you know, even air flown, it could get here in a couple of days, but it's even more expensive. So you're looking at, you know, your a set of your flats, say it costs us a grand to ship to within the continental US, 48 states, uh, to the 50th state, you're gonna double that. And if you don't have a good freight forwarder, maybe even 1.5 times what your, you know, what your freight forwarder can give you for. So because of that, you're looking at everything just pretty much doubling in cost to operate, um, let alone we living here as humans. So the labor expense therefore goes up too because we have to pay people more for them to work here because they have to live off of, um, you know, food and, and things that are more expensive. And so, again, it's a, it's a positive loop where it just feeds into this more expensive model. Um, because of that, people are a little bit astonished, you know, um, a little bit taken back by the price of goods and the price of the food that they're ordering from us. And, and I can say that confidently for most farmers in Hawaii that we have a problem where a lot of... Um, a lot of farmers here in Hawaii feel like they shouldn't sell their goods for that much because historically food should be accessible and we all need it. Now, that might be great in theory, but as a business, the business tanks. 
So a lot of folks have a hard time. A lot of farmers have a hard time in Hawaii, especially immigrant farmers. They don't know how to price their foods based on the labor hours and the cost of operating. And so for us, we price it according to a very calculated um, you know, set of um, parameters that, that are used to derive our price points. And so we can look people in the eye and be like, yeah, this micro she silk for one ounce costed you $7. In the mainland, yeah, you might get it for $4, but it costed us $7. And we can look at them in the eye and say that because we have done our homework and we, we've calculated it out. And that's even with, you know, like I said, we're, we're implementing machines. We're doing harvesting with a harvester. We're um, only working here pretty much once a week outside of watering. So that is the, the strategy and the way that we as a small farm can succeed. But it's a problem because the cost of food is that high. And uh, I remember coming home from college. I went, you know, was doing college in San Diego, and the cost of my meal to to make a bunch of tacos. When I, the, one of the first nights I came home was three times as much as it costed me in the mainland for the same ingredients, and I was just used to buying these certain ingredients in it. I was like, oh my god, I can't eat the same way. Now it doesn't mean we can't eat well here. We just eat what's more local and in season and accessible but you know if, if you're stuck on your diet and you have to source an avocado you ha you think you only can get Haas avocados it's like well maybe you should get the local butter avocado you know it's twice as big organic um same price and then you still can make out so that's the way i approach eating here and and i think that um people can do the same but yeah, it's a, it's a challenge for sure as a producer. Basically here, there's a nursery system for our aquaponics. And we keep our seedlings in this system for the first three weeks, four weeks maybe if they're growing really slow. But we try to transfer them out at three weeks. So um, you saw there, there weren't any plants in our grow out system at the moment because we just followed a long period of uh, rain and so what comes with that are all the soft-bodied insects and the easiest way for us to get rid of them is to just nix all of the plants in that bed and um, we only do that during a period where there's no need for lettuce sales you know and i was just explaining to you that our um our main account for our lettuce just told us that they wanted to just switch their menu and with that, we took the opportunity to, to say, hey, you know, we'll reset our beds and then come back stronger in, you know, another eight weeks, which isn't too long. But, but we're already, you know, and that way we don't need a spray. So just thinking about the environment, thinking about food safety for humans, um, also thinking about labor. So if we have to spray them every couple days, every week, just to keep the bugs down, is it worth it for us? Not really. We have such a small system that it's better to just start from scratch. But you can see the, the water's filling up here on a timer. And um, we use extruded clay just as a, a base media. We could go without the clay here and just do it in the plastic, but it, the clay weighs down this um, hydroponic grow bed nicely. And it allows us to also diversify if we wanted to grow any sort of other crops in here, we could. Yeah, so here's a good shot of our leafy green lettuce. And um, we use these, again, talking about sustainability or at, at least like low impact farming. We know we use plastics, we know you, we use foam, but we selected Oasis biocubes that break down or at least compost, I think by like 80%, 85% within a year. Um, it's their latest product. So we're happy with the way that everything's growing. You can see it's nice and consistent. Germination was good. Growth is good. Everything looks healthy. So this will fill up as we go. I have another one to pop in here tomorrow. And, you know, sooner or later, all of our grow beds will be filled and our production will be back. Uh, so we do aquaponic lettuce. We do microgreens, and then the last part of our production is edible flowers. And of, of course, we're gearing everything towards these high-end restaurants.
But the butterfly pea is a phenomenal little flower in a sense that this vine has been here for over two years now. And every season just puts out tons and tons of flowers. And these flowers are widely used in the whole form, petaled or depetaled or even powderized. Um, a lot of the bartenders are using these nowadays for coloring drinks. So really fun product to work with them on. And yeah, every week we, we harvest about 200 of them. Okay, yeah, for the, those folks that aspire to be an urban farmer in their residential zone, or even just a tight knit farming community where, you know, if you're drinking beer, like you're having a Coors Light and you get a little bit too <laughs> loud, <laughs> your neighbors can hear everything you say, let alone like we're talking about business and they're, they're, they're in your business, literally. Now you have to keep that in mind when you talk. It's just part of the deal. And the way we kind of uh, keep ourselves from pissing anyone off is we have conversations with our neighbors. We give them fresh food when they want it, when they need it, even when they don't ask for it. Uh, we share what we produce. But we also cue them in and we, we ask them if it's okay to, to be operating at these times. So we're not just going and doing what's good for us, it's what's okay for the neighborhood and the neighbors that are directly adjacent to this property. And one of the neighbors right here asked, actually asked us not too long ago if we wanted to expand into their yard. So if you're a good neighbor, you never know. They asked us to expand into their yard with the idea that they don't use their backyard. They maybe can get a little bit of money for it. Um, in the same breath, she also said, hey, we love hearing you guys out here. It's an older, it's a older residential neighborhood. There's a lot of grandparents here. All their kids have left the home, they're by themselves. So what's really neat about here is, in this neighborhood is that we provide a little bit of positive energy that these people kind of want. They want this background noise that maybe the TV usually serves, but instead it's a bunch of young farmers just bickering at each other, <laughs> you know. Now, but there's a healthy balance of uh, noise that you can make and. And if your neighbors are up for it, I think it, it makes for a good relationship with your neighbor. Yeah, so this farm, again, started in 2017. We started with aquaponic beds. We started with one. And then we scaled up to two. And then we learned that we were not putting enough nutrients into the system, so we did decoupled aquaponics. That allowed us to stay within our same infrastructure footprint and produce in both beds. That, the iterations of the aquaponics alone were so gradual that it wasn't until two-ish years later that we figured out how to maximize the system. We were producing, and it goes down to, you know, even just understanding crop cycles. But I think more on the real technical side, it came down to understanding just the basics of aquaponics, like I said, even though we were experienced in aquaculture and, and um, horticulture, as a team, we were still learning the system. So every little thing like, okay, do we want to produce with shade cloth? Do we want to produce with thrip net? You know, we use a lot of agrabon at first, but we realized that the airflow is not good. So all of the decisions change through time. And then also through seasons, you have to understand seasonality within your area. So where we thought, oh, there's never going to be pests if we use this agrabond. It's like, no, once they get in there, they're in there. So, you know, at that point, you want to free them out and you want to be able to, you want to have accessible cloths where you can maybe spray neem oil. Um, so, all of the decisions will change the iteration or it'll, it'll take you to your next iteration in design ultimately to the point where we are now where, you know, basically we're looking at the most recent iteration that works for us in this environment um, three and a half years later. And I really feel like 
it's in this year that our business model really started to take off because we finally figured out the recipe that works for this yard. And you, now we took it from the aquaponics and then we built out the first microgreen station, which was multi-tiered. And we figured out how, what, what's the spacing between those shelving do we need to allow natural light to come from the sides? Again, we're not supplying light directly above it. We're not supplying water directly above it. Um, nobody in, in Hawaii was growing microgreens like this. To this date, very few are. And um, very few can in the U.S. Because, you know, like we're talking about, Hawaii has year-round growing conditions. Other people cannot. So what's here is unique, like you're saying. And... Um, Every little structure that we've put up really considers the microclimates that are in that particular zone um, and adjusted for in our growing. Again, everything is intentional. Yeah, so right now we're looking at a business model that if we were to take really roundabout numbers from this year and, and copy and paste it to next year, we're virtually a $200,000 gross operation. Um, we wanna take this model and put it out onto a one to two acre multi-use farming platform. So whether, for Hawaii, that's probably an agriculture two zone lot. It's difficult to get land in Hawaii, but at some point we will crack the code to be able to acquire land. and. At that time, we want to expand and diversify again. This is a very niche type of farming method, and we want to, one, expand our aquaponics. We, we really enjoy doing that. There's a, a great need for lettuce year-round in Hawaii, and like I said, 70% of our vegetables are imported. So that's a huge um, part of our next step, but we also want to get into trees because we want to look at the longevity of producing and we feel like producing starches on trees is like one of the most sustainable ways to grow food in Hawaii. And we can do it with indigenous crops that have been widely used by everybody who lives here and, and they're familiar with those. So directly impacting, our vision is to directly impact the food system by having a mix of you know, fast growing crops, like really fun crops to the more sustainable crops and even fish having a protein source on the farm. And again, as a small farm, you're making a small dent in food security, but you're impacting your direct community, which I think for any business is the goal. You want to start with impacting people that matter around you. And then if it expands to something bigger, 10 acres, 20 acres, maybe we have satellite farms everywhere and take over the world. Like that's cool, but it has to start organically and it has to start with the things that we've already proven that works. Yeah. So we're gonna take over the world. <laughs>